The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to Gate City Chronicles. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. And today I have, uh, again, uh, attorney Mark Osborne uh, with me and because I had asked him back because there are some other issues that I wanted to talk to him about. And I'm glad that you came back. Thank you for coming oh, back onto the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be back. You're, uh, you know, we, we really appreciate your advice, and I noticed you brought some books with you today, so that's uh, some law books. Uh, we, we, we're seeing some some conversation in the news these days about the death penalty. Yes. And my wife and I, we love to watch uh, the, uh, a lot of the uh, mysteries, you know, who did it, you know, the, the uh, semi, uh, 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 what do you call them, the shows that, that show the steps of a murder or, or, or not a murder, uh, yes. discovery or, or something like that. True crime stories. True yes, crime stories. Absolutely. And, and more and more often we're finding that, oh my gosh, that guy was innocent and he went through all this time, mm -hmm. having done nothing wrong, but because either a prosecutor or an attorney or, or somebody laid a, a charge at him that he couldn't disapprove or she couldn't disprove, and went through hell for years. And, and it almost took a, an act of God in order for this person to be exonerated. And we're, we're seeing more and more stories like that, even as of recent, we, we've seen a gentleman that went, was put in jail. and whether he did something or not, but there, there were some foul things that were going on, apparently. Yeah. So I wanted you to come on the show and talk a little bit, uh, particularly about the death penalty. Okay. Um, I recently interviewed a gentleman by the name of Randy Steidel. Yes. And Randy was on death row for 12 years. Come to find out that the prosecuting attorney, uh, well, Randy actually was a whistleblower against the prosecuting attorney, and there just happened to be a murder a week later. And so the prosecuting attorney pinned it on him really? without any evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, but because he was at a bar, that, that you know, it's, so anyway, mm -hmm. 12 years on death row, finally he was exonerated. And the process to, to prove your innocence, it almost seems impossible. The stars have got to line up a very specific and certain way. It is an uphill climb. Once that final verdict comes down, either by a judge or a jury, it's a long road back home. I mean, you better be able to find a major procedural mistake that was made, mm -hmm. or you better hope that you have diligent investigators and attorneys who have not given up on you who are willing to go look for the new evidence that is required to make a showing to get a new trial. And that's really what happened. There was you know, just somebody that didn't give up. Even his own brother, who was a, a state police officer, uh, thought, well, you know, you don't get accused because you're not guilty. And, and you can't go into something like that. You, you, we are to be presumed innocent, uh, you know, upon, you know. Yes. If that gets lost, then, then you're, like, you, there's an uphill battle. It is an uphill battle. And oftentimes, we are always told that you are presumed innocent until you are proven guilty. But we have certain mechanisms in the law that sometimes run counter to that. For example, if you're accused of murder, you're not getting out on bail. If you are accused of a crime where the allegation is particularly heinous, then long before a trial, you could find yourself sitting in jail on a very high cash bail simply because the charges sound bad. Mm -hmm. you know. And so while our bail law in New Hampshire leans in favor of someone being released until they're awaiting a trial, with the exception of a murder allegation, um, yeah, the reality is that you're not always presumed innocent 
until proven guilty by the system. Oftentimes when I pick a jury, and it doesn't matter what someone's charged with. By the way, you're sure. a defense attorney, the yes. former prosecuting attorney. Former prosecuting attorney, yes. So yeah, you've seen both sides of this. I have, yeah. I have. We've, I've been a defense lawyer for eight or nine years now. And it doesn't matter what kind of charge I'm defending or for which I'm representing someone. I feel it in my gut that when the, the potential jury pool comes in, all right, they look where the prosecutor's sitting, and then they look where I'm sitting and the defendant, my client. I can just feel the gaze, and I can feel their brains and their hearts saying, what did that person do to get here? You know, and now New Hampshire has changed the law so that in non- uh, capital offenses, one can ask questions of the jury and war dear them and try to winnow them out. There's some disagreement as to how well that works. But the first question I find myself asking is, when you all came in here, raise your hands, how many of you looked at my client and thought to yourself instinctively, <laughs> what did he do or she do to get here? You know, it's funny when I'm up at the Capitol and I see a lobbyist sitting out uh, either at, at the Secretary of State's, uh, there's a bench in front of the Secretary of State's office and there's a, either a lobby sitting out there or they're sitting out in the hall. Mm -hmm. First thing I ask them yep. is, are you uh, in the principal's office? Because it <laughs> looks like you're sitting there waiting to get in trouble. It totally does. You know, and uh, it's, it's a reality. But uh, when you're in that position, you, you, know, you, you, are, you know that they're looking at you and, 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 and you've got to, well, you've got to feel small. You got to feel, and how do you look? How do you, how, what kind of expressions, what kind of emotions do you go through when all these people are walking by you? Now, what are they going to think? Right. What are they going to think? But uh, with our system, mm -hmm. are there safeguards to protect somebody if they're falsely accused? Uh, how do you fix that? I mean, uh, if they're falsely accused? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first. By a prosecutor. By a prosecutor. Or a police uh -huh. officer. Sure. I mean, the first thing that you have to do, and I'm not advertising, but to answer your question honestly, is you really need to get a lawyer. You know, and you need to get someone who is going to be diligent, who's going to hire an investigator, who's going to go to the scene, and just isn't going to sit in their chair and read the file and somehow think that the facts of your case are going to come to them. So, you know, the best defense or the best offense towards exoneration is even though you've done nothing wrong, you've got to work at it. You know, you've got to be involved in your case because the reality is, and I don't want to be blasphemous, but the reality is at no point during a pretrial conference, at no point during a trial, at no point during a jury deliberation will the heavens open up and this, this, this knowledge, this absolute certainty as to what happened that knowledge will never reign over anybody because we're only people. You know what I mean? And so one cannot be lazy about his or her defense ever. Even if you know you're innocent, guess what? The prosecutor or the police officer or the whomever, the grand jury that indicted you, you know, you got all these protections that you're supposed to have. Right. But I always tell people, you know, even the clients who I do not believe are guilty of what they're accused, I say, listen. Anyone who's ever been found not guilty after trial was first arrested, was first indicted, and had to sit and sweat through that entire trial, never knowing that they were going to be found not guilty. And what a place to be. Uh, mm -hmm. We recently saw in, in uh, Massachusetts, I believe it was, that uh, DNA being compromised. I believe there were 40,000 cases of DNA. And what troubles me is that even though that happened, even though they proved it, even though this person, I don't know if she went to jail or not, I sure. don't think she did. But the one who handled it and was, those people are still in jail based upon that evidence. Absolutely. How does that, how does that work? What do we do about that? Right. Uh, what if somebody was convicted of a death row or, 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 or of a capital crime or... Mm -hmm. It, and, and it comes out that, oh, my God, the DNA says it was tampered with. Mm -hmm. I, I'm telling you, I, it wasn't me. Right. You know, right. what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if I had the answer, then, then you and I would be very, very rich and, and beloved men. So I guess what I would say 
you know, where do we start? In New Hampshire, I would suggest that we start by realizing that, you do, that the judicial system, it's not a machine. You know, you don't plug a person in and hope that the right result comes out at the other side like we would a cookie or a candy bar. Um, I think sometimes it's a question of resources. Now, I don't know if this statistic is true any longer, but I remember that we had a Supreme Court justice say that for every dollar that's collected in taxes in New Hampshire, a penny of it goes to the judiciary. Okay. I don't know if that's true. If that is, I certainly would think that perhaps we need to revisit that, right? But what, I, what we definitely can control is who sits as judges in our state, all right? I am in courts all over New Hampshire, and I can tell you we have some of the finest legal minds that I've ever seen, and we have people who I can't believe they even have a law license, let alone a, a judicial robe. So okay. you've seen the full spectrum. I've seen the full spectrum, and I don't always know that the people who approve judicial appointments have a clue as to what the hell's going on. You know, I know that not all of our executive council has much experience in, um, in being in the courts. I'm not sure to what degree our governor has experience being in the courts. And the people who advise as to whom the judges should be appointed. You know, I've been in this business for 12 years. I don't remember a governor, an executive counselor, anybody ever calling me, ever and saying, hey, what do you think of this lawyer who now wants to become a judge or this judge who wants to become a promotion? You know, and yeah, how did they get into that position of being appointed in the first place? They apply. There's an application process. Mm -hmm. So anybody who thinks that they'd be a good judge applies because they think they'll be a good judge. And then it's a matter of a selection process where there are some attorneys involved, and these attorneys may or may not always be in the courts. Uh, a report it goes to the executive council. The executive council interviews them. There's a public hearing where people can come and offer what they think is, is a good idea. But the presumption is always, well, this person, of course, is going to become a judge. So why am I going to go up there, say something badly about that person? And then potentially be in front of them. And you know you're going to be in front of them. <laughs> I mean, that's just what's going to happen. Right. Exactly. The stars are going to line up. Hey, they are. Remember when? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I would say that the first thing we start is maybe revising how judges are appointed mm -hmm. and maybe reinvigorating the, the scrutiny to which um, they are viewed. I think that's where we start because it's going to be these people deciding whether or not that evidence comes in or not or, or illegal evidence gets kicked out. They're going to be the ones deciding, do you get a new trial or not? Mm -hmm. You know, and all they're going to have in front of them is the record. Again, they're not going to have that divine knowledge that guy's innocent or that guy's not. You know, they're going to have fidelity to the law. Right. And we've got to make sure we get good people. So we start there, I think, is one thing. Now, I was talking to a lobbyist today. They're up there at the Capitol a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I went, up to, went up to her, and I, I just sat down, and I looked at her, and I said, you know, I, I need some help. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I know a person who was, uh, I interviewed at one point in, she was a victim of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And as a victim of domestic violence, she, she basically lost her property on top of it because the, the perpetrator didn't obey a court order. But the first thing I said to the lobbyist was, listen, I know that I, I rag on the, the judges. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not trying to do that here. I need help with this person because I think a judge really overlooked something. Mm -hmm. And in the process, the, the victim of domestic violence became homeless. Right. So, but when I said, you know, here comes Avard again, you know, talking bad about another judge, she just nodded, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it's because it's the same old story, same old story, same old. And I don't, I, I want the system to work. Right. I want the cops to be re respected. I, I want, when they come forward, I want to be able to trust what they've done. And right. I want them to be supported. I want our judges to be a absolutely impeccable. Mm -hmm. I want to look up to them without, without question and know that whether you're rich mm -hmm. or poor, mm -hmm. connected or not connected, that fidelity thing that you said was going to be adhered to in the law. And right now, I'm just hearing over and over and over again people falling through the cracks. Not everybody's always telling the truth. Sure. I wasn't born yesterday. Right. But, you know, after a while, when you hear so many different cases of different varying, you wonder, uh, you know, can, can the co uh, not, not the cops, but the, the judges be so cavalier at times or worn out or not have enough time? Mm -hmm. 
Um, is there an accountability? And I think that needs to be the new phrase of, of this next coming election. A transparency is a wonderful thing. Everybody loves to vote. There's this whole thing about transparency. Mm -hmm. but without accountability, it's meaningless. Right. Transparency I have found in both the political realm, locally and nationally, as well as sometimes in the legal um, realm. Transparency is a word that one often hurls at an opponent when, in their mind, they're not being transparent. You know, <laughs> now, I'm, I'm perfectly projection. transparent, but you're not. You know, right. and we see that in all kinds of spheres of our lives. You know, I mean, one idea that, that we've heard kicked around for a while is instead of this lifetime appointment of a judge until they're 70, okay, mm -hmm. what about a seven-year term or a five-year term? And then they can petition to be reappointed for another term. Based upon their work performance. Exactly. And, and put in place some kind of sincere, meaningful review process. Mm -hmm. you know? and, if you, and, if, and if we know that there's going to be a review process you know, five years or seven years or whatever down the road, then we can start having people observe the judges now. You know what I mean. And I think that's a, that's a, a level of, so that you're, you're not being elected every year right. or every two years, but you bring it to some amount of accountability to the people and maybe have that done through their representatives mm -hmm. rather than the public right. uh, because then that becomes over political. That's correct. The same way with the Attorney General's office or some of these commissioners, mm -hmm. uh, they've, you know, really, who are they accountable to? One person. Right. The, the governor. And so if something would embarrass the governor, well, you know, we'll just we'll wait on that. Right. And that's the part of the bureaucracy thing that I think people miss. They're always you know, talking about the politicians, and, that's, yes. and they should. That's sure. fine. Mm -hmm. But the other part of the puzzle is the executive branch that was appointed that operates these agencies. Mm -hmm. There's no accountability to the people. We have a thing called gel car, but that's only for rules. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the courts, with the, with, you know, I, I know I wanted to talk about the, the death penalty, but again, there's, you know, when people fall through the cracks on this level, right? Wow. I mean, and, and, and who, who answers for it? Who answers for them falling through the cracks? How do we regain what we've lost? Mm -hmm. um, and I often say, you know, you know what well, somebody, you know, says to me, uh, would, would say to me, well, I'm for the death penalty, but, you know, if justice is blind. That's true, but what if somebody's peeking? Exactly. Sometimes, sometimes justice can be deaf and dumb, too, right. not just blind, <laughs> provided Thank we're... You. That's a better illustration. You know, I mean, because we're all fallible. People make mistakes. I have seen excellent lawyers, excellent lawyers, lawyers I wish I could be as good as, mm -hmm. you know, make a mistake where we all sit in the back and be like, what just happened there, you know? And, and people make mistakes. You know, or people bring their prejudices to the system. And it's not just the judges and the prosecutors. You know, defense lawyers make mistakes. I've seen, I've seen lawyers get disciplined by judges because a lawyer pled a client to a crime without ever having admitted on record, without ever having read the police reports. You know, so sometimes even the best can get lazy or the best can get sidetracked. Or maybe the best had a death in their family and they missed something. You know, and that's why I think what we're talking about, the need for, for a balance and the need for checks, is because anyone can make a mistake. You know, you get jurors in there, you know, who say that I can be impartial and that, yes, I will be just and fair. And then they're sitting there, you know, and, and it runs the gamut. Again, a juror who said, I know nobody, is now looking at the client or the witness and says, you know what, I know I heard that name. I know I saw them in court. But you know what? That's my babysitter from 10 years ago. You know? Or they say, I realize I guess I do have this prejudice, or I do have a sincere impediment that will not allow me to be just mm -hmm. in rendering a verdict. So when you think about just the tremendous potential for human fallibility in all cases, whether they're rape allegations, they're murder allegations, the question becomes, particularly with the death penalty, and I don't have an agenda. I really don't know how I feel about the death penalty. Mm -hmm. you know? But what I do know is that, and I wrote some things down here. According to the Death Penalty Information Center, uh, 156 people have been exonerated from death row from 1973 up to 2015. Wow. I mean, we're not talking 19 teens 
You know, I mean, 1973 to 2015, you know, nobody was coming into those courtrooms, I imagine, and saying, that guy's a witch, you know, or, gee, you don't need evidence, you know. So that's kind of interesting to me. The last person that was executed in uh, New Hampshire, I understand, was a guy named Howard Long in 1939 in Concord for convictions of rape and murder, okay. And so I try to approach the death penalty just as a normal person, right? I'm very lucky that I can sit here and talk to you as somebody who has never had a family member, a spouse, a child raped, murdered, tortured. I've never been put in a situation in my entire life where I would cling to the hope that somebody would be executed. I've never experienced that. So I can't relate to what somebody might go through. On the other hand, if I'm trying to be logical, and I know that 156 people since the 70s were almost executed, right? Were almost executed mm -hmm. because the system did something incorrect. You know, I don't know how many times I would put my finger in a light switch and get shocked before I would stop. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be 156 times. Right. You know what I mean? So you really have two issues with the death penalty, don't you? Do you risk executing somebody who's innocent? And our entire system says what? You know, our entire history is about it's better that 100 guilty people go free than one person who's innocent render a, a horrible fate, right? So you, what do you do with potentially innocent people? And then the other question is, what do you do with someone who is guilty, right? I mean, if we're going to be consistent and we say we're not for the death penalty, that means the guy who killed one person. Maybe that means Saddam Hussein. Maybe that means Hitler. Right? I mean, so it's searching for consistency in this issue, I find very vexing. And I don't know the answer, and I'm really glad to talk to you about it. Yeah, I, morally, I think, I think it is just to do so for somebody who unequivocally is. I, I think it, it's been a, a principle that has been carried out for, since history and memorial. Mm -hmm. However, on the other hand, to, it, to execute somebody in, who is innocent, you have blood on your hands. And that I, I, I can't, I don't tolerate. And, and people, are, people say, you know, well, you know, New Hampshire hasn't had any executions in such and such a long time, and we really don't have a problem with it. Okay, <laughs> that begs the question. Right. So do we wait till we have a problem? Exactly. Or do we head this off, seeing how that this has been happening in other states? There's about 150, as you said. Mm -hmm. Would it be okay to just say, hey, look, before we do that, before we put somebody to death um, that could potentially, you know, it's all circumstantial evidence. Some people say that's, a, that's probably the best standard of evidence. And mm -hmm. Can we put a pause on it right. and, and make it so that there's, there's some extra safeguards? Mm -hmm. So to protect one life, I mean, because if you execute somebody or put somebody on death for over 12 years who was innocent, I believe that breaks, uh, I think it's the eighth, well, I mean, it, it really violates a slew of laws, doesn't it? I mean, right. you really, you know, one's due process uh, is almost getting snuffed out because mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get new evidence it's and new trials too, if right? you're dead. You've got the cruel and unusual punishment aspect of it, which, which uh, some people argue very vociferously that that's what the death penalty is, you know. Um, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole host of, of challenges. And again, when you go, when, and this isn't a matter of theory, right? And these are the only 156 people that we know of. Correct. Right? I mean, you know someone was working awfully hard for each one of those cases, you know, years worth of research and things like that. And, and just from a legal point of view, I, I brought a book because, you know, I, I try to read them and I try to, and, yeah, you good. know, my clients <laughs> like it when I read, you know. Yeah. But if anybody's watching at home or, or you're thinking to yourself, right, close your eyes for a minute and envision every single picture of a law office you've ever seen, okay? And if you open your eyes, you see a bunch of these books. Now, the reality is most of the stuff is online, so you're not going to see a bunch of these in my office. You're just not. But you're going to see a bunch of books in, these, in, in movies and everything else. Do you know what's in these books? People want to say the law. Yeah, I know, the law. But you know what the law is in, in, when it comes to courts and cases? This is a book that contains nothing but challenges and potential mistakes. And that's really what I love about our system. Every case book you see is a situation where someone is saying 
that the courts or the prosecutor or the jury or someone in our system made a mistake. And in a lot of these cases, there's a lot of decisions where the Supreme Court says, yes, a mistake was made. Or, no, a mistake was not made, but we're glad that we had the opportunity to review this, and we'll make sure maybe this doesn't happen again. Wow. So that's what I love about our system. I went to a foreign country the other day, and I was talking to somebody, and they were lamenting about the corruption in their system. And I said, you know, our system is not perfect, but we do try to get it right, all right? So to bring that, loop that back to the death penalty, how do you correct a mistake when the aggrieved is dead? They don't get to get in here, right. you know? And so, and you think, what, every shelf has a couple hundred books or whatever. That's a lot of times where a court said either a mistake was made, let's fix it, or a mistake was not made, but we've had the chance to find that out because, hey, guess what? The parties were alive. Yeah. I, and I can probably hear the viewers yelling at the TV now saying, yeah, but what, what about a terrorist that comes in mm -hmm. and shoots up 14 people? In my opinion, that's an act of war, or, mm -hmm. and, and that should be handled differently or federally. And, yes. and uh, personally, no nights. Sure. <laughs> yep. You know, uh, but when it comes to, uh, you know, accusations, you know, it, think about it. When you have a carpet cleaner that comes to your house, or a janitor, or a maid, yeah. they're collecting your DNA. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's everywhere. The sale, uh -huh. that might not be plausible in your mind, but you know what? I haven't been a cleaner for 27 years. Mm -hmm. You wonder, you know, if, if you're going to do something strictly on DNA, mm -hmm. if you had an evil heart. Right. You know, I, I always say... I try to say to jury sometimes, the prosecutor wants you to believe that my client is a horrible person that did something very bad. But if you believe that someone could do something very badly, something that they're accused of doing, I also want you to be open to the mind, and I want you to follow that human nature assumption all the way through, and I also want you to realize that not only can somebody do something bad, but somebody can also lie about something bad having been done. And that's where the evidence comes in. And sometimes I'm lucky enough to get a couple of lights that go off and say, oh, you know what, you're right. People always say, you're a defense lawyer. How do you defend someone who you know is guilty? You know what I always say? I say I love it. I love it. I love when I know someone's guilty. Do you know why? Because I represented people in the past who I've known to be innocent. I've known to be not guilty. And that's when you don't sleep. That's when you don't eat. That's when you sweat all night. And hope, like anything, that the jury is going to say not guilty. Because the reality is, if that guy, that gal, who you know did not do what they're accused of, gets convicted, what are you going to do? You have no idea. You have no idea. And you know now the chances of getting, getting a new trial, winning on a, an appeal, forget about it. You, the turtles rushing to the sea, trying to dodge the crabs and the, and the birds, they have a better chance of getting to the ocean than you ever will of a new trial or an appeal. And so, yeah, we're talking about heavy stuff. We're talking about life, liberty, limb, and freedom. What else is there? Yeah, I, with that interview with uh, Mr. Steidel, <clears throat> I remember making a statement that, uh, that really troubled me, and that is that prosecutors or even the police officers, and this, I'm not dumping on these people. Sure, no. But the reality is, is that uh, when they first start talking to you, they don't have to tell you the truth. They right. can get a false confession. I've, I've talked with uh, uh, prosecutors from the attorney general's office, and, and mm -hmm. where you know people can throw either the death penalty at you, or they could say, yeah, this person said they saw you do it, and, and draw out a false conviction or yeah. a false confession. And then when you're exonerated, you can't go back and say, hey, well, you, you lied. You both faced lied to my eyes. Well, you, we have immunity. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a level that, which is kind of frightening, that when somebody comes after you with the power of any agency and they have the authority to, to lie, yep. misconstrue, to draw out facts that go to their case rather than to the truth, that's frightening. It's very frightening. 
And I, you know, again, we've seen it where people have never wavered and have said time and time again throughout that entire interview for one hour, two hour, four hours, well into the morning, no, I did not do that. And guess what? They still get charged. We've had people say, well, you know what? I didn't do it, but I'm, I'm talking to the officer. I'd really like to go home, or my child's going to be home, or if my parents find out I'm dead, okay, yeah, I did it. And then you get that false confession. You know, and don't forget, too, many of the people, not all, but many of the people who wind up in the, in the justice system, they're not the richest people, usually. They're not the most well-educated people. You usually have a long tradition of physical abuse, perhaps, mental abuse, drug use, limited IQs. So it's not really a fair fight, is it? I mean, you've got somebody who knows nothing about the system. Okay? There are people who think that once you get arrested, maybe you go to jail, maybe you don't. This whole idea about a court is a foreign concept to them. Okay? And they think, I just got to maybe make this police officer happy. I just got to cooperate and make this police officer like me. And I see it all the time with well-educated people in my DWI cases. If I just blow into the machine, he's going to let me go. If I just give the officer my weed or if I just walk the line, they're going to let me go. Because that, that enticement is there, you know. And oftentimes we find out, no, it was just a, ma uh, a manner by which to gather evidence. And sometimes it's reliable and sometimes it isn't. But as long as the word sometimes is in that, in that summary, mm -hmm. I have real concerns about irreversible mistakes, like what we're talking about today. Right. So you would, you would definitely then champion the idea that there, there would be some level of accountability for our system and, and, and some more safeguards, basically, for the people. I think so. You know, when we're talking about the death penalty, it's a, it's a penalty that's, what, been around for 300 years? I think perhaps it's a little overdue to, to review it. Just to review it. And, yeah. and it just seems to me, because I've, I've been hardcore all my life, mm -hmm. uh, and, and thinking that there's a, there's a just balance going on here. But it doesn't, as time goes on, as I get a little older and I see how the system works and how, how I hear people on, on certain civil matters, whether sure. they're the family courts where children are being taken away wrongfully, yeah. or how the departments bureaucrats work mm -hmm. and that includes all you know the the, the court systems the the our, our justice systems and all right. that it entails right uh, well uh. you know I, I don't want anybody anybody's blood on my hands or anybody else's exactly. and yet I don't want somebody to go away free defense attorneys mm -hmm. oh my gosh they're a, they're a troublesome bunch let me tell <laughs> you, know, you. you said something <laughs> And it's stuck in my head because I think I was one of those people at one point in time. Uh, yeah, you said something to the effect, well, I, I'm not on the dark side. or <laughs> I have not moved uh, my son. Yes. You know, and, and I do think it's admirable because, uh, you know, for somebody to advocate for somebody, granted, even if somebody's guilty, you need somebody that's competent to not necessarily exonerate a guilty person. I don't think that's the, the charge you have, but right. to mitigate the uh, the damages uh, sure. at some level, to to uphold that idea that somebody is innocent until proven guilty is extremely admirable, because okay. the mm -hmm. system is not in your favor, right. and so I don't think it's the dark side. I actually think it's the guy mm -hmm. with the with the with the knight. You know, right. uh, and, and I think our whole system is there to provide justice for everybody. And that aside, and I know I ran out of time, so we're just kind of going over a little bit, which is good. For, but sure, victims yes have no rights. It's it's a tough area of law, all right, because under the Constitution of the United States and really of New Hampshire. You know, it's not, those constitutions are not there to protect victims. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that's correct. The constitution is there to defend the accused, right? The legislature then passed uh, some years ago a Victim's Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. How is that enforced? Well, it's more, in my mind, 
It's more about making sure the victim is informed. Making sure, you know, basically it, it, it ended or sought to end the issue of prosecutors resolving cases without letting the victim know, you know. It, it requires that the prosecutor gets victim input before making the final decision, all right? Um, and the judge will always ask, or they should always ask, did you check with the victim? Are they here? Do they want to make a statement? So, you know what? You're correct in that there is no law that gives a victim the kind of redress that one would want when a guilty person has done harm or violence or, or criminality to them. You're right. The only protection a victim has is at least a statutory guarantee that they can be part of the process. You know, but again, how many times after a case is resolved does a victim say, I don't feel whole? Right. You know, it, it didn't, it, it can't replace what I've lost. So in that respect, you're and correct. And I'm still suffering. Oh, absolutely. We had the EMS uh, people on, on here once and they were, they went on a normal call and they got brutalized by a person. Mm -hmm. And one of them, uh, Lynn, I mean, she's still going through her operations, a million dollars right. worth of and they were in the court hearing, and the judge did say something to the effect of the victims here, and the attorney said no, but they were sitting in the back. Ouch. Right. So what kind of recourse did they have? <laughs> yeah. They were right there. Right. And the attorney looked back and said no. Mm -hmm. And that was a case where the, the perp. <laughs> yep. yep, sure. Was definitely guilty. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. if you have cries for help, you have the 911s, you have the scars, or the whole nine yards, but yep. she was well connected. And daddy was rich and well connected. And so there is definitely, you know, that's something that I would love to address in the, in the future is, sure. is something that would help victims be made whole, whether mm -hmm. it's through the court systems where, you know, where somebody is, yes. uh, you know, they, it, it, it was absolutely mm -hmm. clear that, that they were harmed. Um, somehow that they, they can get that re mm -hmm. redress. But also when the state does that to people. They do. On a regular basis, people get bulldozed, mm -hmm. and then they turn around and go, what happened? Exactly. Uh, you just got bulldozed. Yep. And by the time you know, that comes to anyone's attention, by the time uh, a remedy might be proper, perhaps the person who did that with the agency or a prosecutor's office, guess what? They've gone off to private practice. They're at a big firm. Thank you. See you later. Left the state, retired, nice pension. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's happened, so. It is. We didn't solve a whole lot today. But, no, but you uh, feel, I feel better, don't yeah, you? <laughs> I do. I want people to be aware that there's, there's potentially some, some legislation out there that will probably want to be putting a pause just to address these issues. It's not getting rid of the death penalty per se, but right. to <clears throat> at least address the issues that, uh, and put a pause on it to put in some more safeguards for people that might be falsely accused. Should we wait until somebody is yeah. and spend millions of dollars mm -hmm. in the process, or, or should we actually be looking to tighten up our, our, our system and making it more accountable to the people? I don't know how anybody, whether you're for the death penalty or against it, I don't know how anyone could be logically against accountability, you know, and right. that's really what we need. And there's, there's a whole bunch of areas, aside from just the death penalty, where sometimes I think, I think improvements could be made. I like your idea on the judges in every five or seven years. Uh, you know, uh -huh. actually, they should welcome that because, hey, I did a good job. Look at my A. You know? Right. I think so. And if they're, they're competent, they're able, keep them on their well past 70. Mm -hmm. But at least let's have a process by which it's not a free ride. Exactly. Know? Well, thanks again for coming on the All show. All right, Kevin. Thank right. you. And if you need a lawyer, call Mark Osborne. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it's important that these type of shows come out. Uh, Gate City Chronicles or Speak Up or some of the other shows that are out there, these are here for you. And we hope that uh, you benefit from it. If you would like to come on the show and talk about something that you'd like to offer to the community uh, or have an expertise in something, we'd love to hear from you. So contact us at gatecitychronicles.gmail.com. Until next week, thanks for watching. Thank you for watching Gate City Chronicles. And we want to thank our sponsor, Aardvark Cleaning. They've been a sponsor for quite a few years now, and uh, we appreciate them being a sponsor. And if you want to be a guest on our show, Contact accessnashua at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story. Until next week, thanks for watching.
preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.